So uh, welcome everyone. This is the British Interplanetary Society, the West Midlands branch. And oops, uh, I'll try and get my slides going. So um, in a few minutes, um, I'll be handing over to our speaker for today, Matthias Persson, who's going to be talking about um, green propulsion with over a decade of flight heritage. And then after that, we'll have some questions and answers. Now I'll be managing it during the, uh, the period while he's talking, so I'll be muting everyone, and then uh, when it comes to questions and answers, I will ask for you to try and attract my attention, either visibly or by dropping me uh, a note in the chat, um, and I will selectively unmute you so that we don't have a, a cacophony. Just to remind everyone, we are recording today's event, and, um, and that's happening now, so if you don't want to be seen uh, or heard, you know, you know what to do. Uh, membership. Um, now, I know about, uh, about a third of you here today are not members. You're very, very welcome. But if you would like to become a member, you can get um, access to uh, large numbers of videos from talks, symposia, conferences. Um, our, when, I, when I joined about 10 years ago, I binge watched. Uh, you couldn't see me for a week. Um, and it's all now uh, even easier to see. It's all now on YouTube in the members only area. We got Spaceflight Magazine. We got um, the uh, we've got uh, JBIS, the, the Journal of the Interplanetary Society, which I get as well. And we got Space Chronicle as well. We have monthly newsletters. Uh, it's a members area, uh, which keeps you up to date with all the the projects that are going on, all the technical projects. Um, we get camaraderie of both enthusiasts and professionals, and of course we've got live live uh, streamed events. Not just like this, but we have the HQ ones that tend to be on a, a slightly bigger scale than ours and, uh, and access to all the stuff on social media as well. So if you believe that the frontiers of space are there to be explored, why not join us? Now, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, uh, Matthias Persson. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk about green propulsion with over a decade of flight heritage. So. Matthias, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me here. I will uh, talk about green propulsion with over a decade of flight heritage. And uh, in space business, it, 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 things take awful lot of time, as you, as, as you are aware of. It takes a lot of time to, to develop something, uh, to get it into flight and get the flight heritage of it. However, uh, in recent years, it has been uh, drastically improved in a way of the let's say new space mentality that is offering uh, an awful lot of more opportunities to get up there to uh, gain some flight heritage but when we started out and i will walk you through a uh, kind of bit of the history here uh, as well so um let's see if i could change the picture here you go so a bit of history uh, so i was the uh, ceo of the company called ecaps or uh, still still named ecaps uh, for over a decade. I worked there until last year uh, when I became a consultant and um, I, I have a bit of uh, experience that I will share with you. And uh, the company was founded in year 2000 as a subsidiary between Volvo Aero Corporation and Swedish Space Corporation. And the purpose of the company was to uh, develop and introduce the green propulsion technology to the market. And at that time, um, nothing like new space was invented. Uh, in uh, you could uh, maybe maybe some people <laughs> would ask what is ECAP stand for, and it's, it's really an abbreviation of Eco ecological advanced propulsion systems. However, you could also read just space backwards, and then you find ECAPS. Uh, 2006, ECAPS was uh, acquired uh, to the complete extent by SSC, so it was a wholly owned subsidiary to Swedish Space Corp. And in 2017, Bradford Engineering acquired ECAPS from SSC. So it uh, became a Bradford Caps and nowadays Bradford Space. So most of the things I, I will show here today will, will uh, come from that time with, with that company. So why green? Why did we here in Sweden start with green uh, propulsion uh, so many years ago? Um, I would say mid of the 90s. And um, the reason for that was that we, we saw a, a, a need for uh, more capable satellites for our scientific missions. And uh, propulsion at the time was very expensive and, and difficult to work with. Uh, and we, we were uh, pioneering uh, smaller satellites in, in Sweden and, and still are 
uh, nowadays the satellite division of Swedish space is OHP Sweden. So uh, we, we have a healthy aerospace industry here in, in, in the country. Uh, so the reason for, for green was to find something that uh, would uh, provide lower personal risks or, or uh, low toxicity. That was one of the requirements we set up early on. It were to be simple to handle and transport and not to use any escape suits for fueling operations. It should be uh, easy to handle. That means that, uh, having a limited vapor, vapor pressure uh, and uh, not being, uh, let's say, toxic or, or hazardous or carcinogenic to work with. Uh, the other thing was, of course, to have it environmentally benign. That was also in the in the sort of uh, um, time of the, the Kyoto Agreement. Uh, it was a bit of focus of, about environment, and you know, all of you that it came back here recently. Uh, high performance was also something we were working with small satellites, smaller spacecraft, and, and having a higher density specific impulse, of course, would uh, premiere and promote uh, longer mission life and smaller tanks and smaller spacecraft, etc. And to have a minimum impact on the uh, infrastructure or the let's say, architecture of traditional spacecraft was also a um, requirement to sort of utilize the commercials of the shelf and cots as, as much as possible uh, to the extent it was uh, yeah, feasible to, to do that. And this altogether were to lead to uh, lower mission costs. Uh, looking at the timeline, uh, in uh, 1995, we started with a sort of assessment and R&D kind of initiative to, to look at the market, what, was, uh, what kind of technologies were around. And to the right, you can see, let's say, the, the timeline going from up to down for, for just the sake of having something different from normal. <laughs> Uh, propellant uh, development invention from 1997 and onwards, you have R&D, characterization, testing, you have to establish some kind of production, you have to qualify it for space, you have to do all kinds of work for range safety approvals to be able to handle it on ranges, and then finally to uh, come to a space demonstration. And you can see that it's, it's more more or less, uh, it's more than a decade that, that kind of uh, that process took more than a decade. And in parallel, we worked with the thruster technology. So thruster development started uh, early on. And in 1999, we, we fired our first thruster at the time. And um, in 2005, we, we got the Prisma mission. That was a demonstration for uh, autonomous formation flying and rendezvous operation between two, two satellites. And uh, the, the green propulsion technology that, that was invented uh, was flying as a, uh, I would say, technology demonstrator and experiment on board. Uh, but uh, very important, of course, for this tech demo mission to provide the Delta V for the mission and formation flying. Um, in 20, uh, 2007, we delivered our prop system, and uh, 2010, the Prisma satellite was launched. And uh, in one year, we accomplished all the objectives for the, for the let's say, in space, uh, activities and demonstrations, and uh, the mission was concluded uh, 2015, after five years. Uh, and you can see it's, it's a fairly significant timeline here. Uh, I think the very important aspect of this R&D and development phases were that we could work with the propellant development and the thrusters and system development at the same time. So we could do the trades uh, and, and compare uh, if you change something in the propellant for the benefit of the thruster and or for the system, some system aspects, that's a very important thing, I believe, in comparison to just work on the propellant and sort of find out the, the, the best uh, characteristics from one aspect. Here, we had to make compromises all the time. And I think uh, uh, compromises uh, is, is really uh, needed in order to find a good system solution at the end of the, at, at end of the day. So uh, going back to what we mean with green propellants here, uh, having a non-toxic, uh, low carcinogenic or low toxicity, low uh, non-carcinogenic, and easy to handle propellant, we looked into different uh, technologies and, and, and honed into, into the ionic liquids, uh, meaning that you have uh, energetic salts that are diluted or uh, solved in, in a solvent. And in this case, we we. Um, uh, Built into the ADM, ammonium dinitramide, as the energetic salt uh, to 
uh, be working in aquapellant. It, it has a, a history back uh, in, in the 70s of, of being used as uh, enhancer into solid uh, oxidizers for, for uh, um, ICBMs, I believe, uh, in Russia. And it was kind of reinvented, as we call it, in uh, at Stanford Research Institute in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, we established some production in Sweden by Urenko Bofors. Uh, so we had, a, a, let's say, a good, good knowledge about this uh, energetic, energetic salt. And um, uh, the good thing with this is it's, very, it's high, highly hygroscopic, which is kind of difficult when you work with a solid uh, rocket and, and have that as a solid oxidizer. Uh, but in this case, it's quite good because we 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 want to dilute that or or, or to uh, solve that into a solution into a solvent. And in this case, we use water as the solvent, and uh, the fuel components being uh, methanol and um, ammonia. Uh, so very let's say uh, small uh, chains of of uh, uh, or small amount of carbon uh, in in this uh, hydrocarbon uh, fuels. Uh, you can see the constituents in the LMP103 as to the lower uh, right. Uh, so it's a fa fair amount of ADN in that, and some methanol, ammonia, and water imbalance. So it, when you open that box, it would it would smell like a you know a window cleaning uh, agent or something like that due to the ammonia. You shouldn't drink it, of course, because it's containing methanol and that would turn you blind. But it's much less methanol than what you have in your camping stove as a fuel when you go out for camping. And that's normally a mix of methanol and, and methanol in order to not create soot when you're, when you're cooking. Uh, you can see a former colleague of mine, Aaron Dinardi here is blending <laughs> propellant. And uh, this is, uh, let's say, how, how, how easy it is to, to, to work with in a way. Uh, normally, of course, you don't uh, make quantities uh, uh, like that, but, but um, just to show it's, it's, uh, it's fairly, fairly uh, stable and um, um, easy uh, propellant to work with. Uh, the process of manufacturing is uh, you do an ion exchange from guanylurea dinitramide, uh, changing uh, that to a potassium uh, dinitramide, and then you put in uh, the ammonia uh, ion there. And the process uh, developed by Urenco is creating 99.6 percent the purity of the ADN. But for uh, the space application, we need to purify that to high high purity level. You can compare that to um, high purity hydrazine, for instance. Otherwise, you would degrade your system and thrusters uh, over time uh, for a long mission. So uh, we have, uh, well, we, I'm always saying we at, about the ECAPS, <laughs> because that's kind of uh, still sitting in, in, the, in the back of my head. But um, uh, ECAPS uh, at the time then developed uh, this uh, refinement process to purify this up to a very high high level of purity in order to get rid of any uh, non-volatile residues and, and things that could sort of maybe clog your thrusters uh, later on. Uh, in parallel with that, a lot of work, of course, uh, has to be done uh, for a space uh, qualified or to get into a space qualification and to be able to handle it on ranges and transport it around the world. So we did a lot of work with material compatibility, uh, testing on storage um, uh, storage uh, for long term at different temperatures, uh, radiation tolerance being one thing, uh, transport classification according to UN and DOT standards and safety testing, and uh, properties, of course, chemical properties. And here you can see some pictures from different tests. Um, just to point out this, uh, I, I hope you see my cursor, but to the upper right you have a tank it's a titanium tank with um, with propellant and uh, a kind of a traditional feed system using traditional cox uh, valves it's been it was sitting there for more than 13 years uh, in total uh, you can see at the center the transport jug we have used for shipment and handling of propellant uh, uh, outside of the satellite and um, it's just a polyethylene jug in 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 a box with uh, some, some kind of uh, absorbent uh, surrounding in a plastic bag. And this is how we can ship this uh, around, actually using uh, commercial aircraft, uh, air transportation. And some of the tests uh, being done during this qualification or, or certification for transportation, this is a, a large-scale gap test where you have the propellant in the tube, 
you separate the propellant from the charge as the uh, kind of yeah C4 or, or, or similar, uh, and and then you separate that with a number of uh, cards, and then you uh, look at when how, how few cards can you use before you get a sort of blast wave passing through that uh, witness plate. Uh, that's one of the tests. Uh, bonfire tests being others, where you have the full transport package subjected to a big fire, and then you see how this propellant would sort of add energy to the fire. Uh, and this is another test where you put uh, a bag of uh, 10 grams of gunpowder into into inside, actually, the, the um, uh, transportation container, and then you fill it up with sand, and you get that uh, gunpowder uh, to ignite, and then you see what happens. And very disappointing for these guys normally working with explosives at Urenco and, and the certi cert certification agency because they, they normally see things blowing up. But in this case, the, the, the cap was just popping up. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and um, uh, nothing else happened. In the bonfire test, it, it was just consumed by the flames, like more, more or less like wood uh, burning. Uh, so very easy to, to deal with in a way. However, it is energetic uh, and uh, one should have uh, to say, be, be careful with it. <laughs> uh, at the thruster side, we were working with um, uh, one Newton thrust level. And uh, for the thrusters, we had to develop a, uh, this is a very traditional uh, layout of the thruster using commercial off the shelf uh, uh, fluid control valves. But we developed a new thrust chamber uh, technology with uh, iridium-iridium uh, thrust chambers uh, sustaining very high temperature of combustion. This propellant combusts at 1600 degrees Celsius, so you can imagine it, it's a very high, high stress on any material at that level. You can't use traditional, let's say, super alloys used for hydrogen thrusters. And um, uh, this thruster has to be they preheated before the, you combust the propellant, uh, otherwise it will not ignite. It's uh, very stable in a way, and, and that's why you have to preheat it in order to initiate the uh, thermocatalytic uh, combustion in the chamber. Uh, to have a catalyst that uh, survive uh, more than fractions of, of, uh, of the time that you need for emission, you, we had to develop our own high, high temperature endurance uh, catalyst. And uh, the constituents of the exhaust species being mostly water vapor, nitrogen, hydrogen, and some carbon monoxide and, and carbon dioxide. So it's essentially what you would get from a biprop uh, as well, uh, combustion. One could say, well, is this really a, a monoprop uh, uh, thruster? Yeah, in a way it, it, it is uh, having similar design propellant is is handled like the monopropellant, but uh, it's uh, like uh, we, we just said, it's containing oxidizer and fuels. It's kind of a pre-mixed bipropellant, really, but uh, stable and handled like a monopropellant. Uh, if we look at the system designs uh, at the time, uh, before the, the Prisma mission, we, uh, we, we thought that the, the full mission were to, to use a, a green propellant uh, alone for propulsion. However, during the design work, uh, we came to the conclusion to mitigate some risks, et cetera, to also fly Prisma with the, the hydrogen system. So it's containing a dual system, both hydrogen and, um, and the uh, ADN-based um, propellant. Uh, and the, the HPGP, HPGP stands for High Performance Screen Propulsion. Uh, it's a conventional layout of a blowdown system with uh, commercials of the shelf components like the tanks, valves, filters, etc. Now tubing being stainless steel, uh, like you, like you normally would would use for for um, uh, liquid monopellant um, propulsion systems on satellites, and the novel part being the one newton thrusters and the um, monopellant LMP 103S as it is designated. It's a very complicated name. Why would you ever call a propellant LMP 103S? Yeah, you could imagine it was one of many, many different lengths and, and, and uh, types that we that we worked with. And uh, uh, liquid monopropellant uh, 103 was um, um, the one that we settled in on, and S being the stabilizer when we added ammonia. So it's just a kind of a work name until it became a de facto name for the propellant. It's kind of difficult to change when, it, when you come too far down the road normally. 
Um, I mentioned that the cat bed re requires preheating, uh, and that is, uh, of course, uh, an important aspect of this. Otherwise, you would not get the combustion. Propellant could be stored like traditional hydrazine between 10 to 50 degrees Celsius. Here you can see the thruster on the Prisma thr uh, spacecraft with uh, its um, heater and um, yeah, thrust, thrust chamber. And the valve, of course, uh, being sitting inside here in the, you know, on the satellite. So uh, going into uh, the uh, one of the key benefits of having a green propulsion being that uh, you can have an easier handling on, on launch site. Here you can see the difference between fueling the hydrogen system on board Prisma uh, and fueling with the green propellant. Uh, here are the guys uh, transferring the green propellant into the satellite. Uh, they don't use any uh, breathing apparatus, they, they don't have uh, a need for, uh, let's say, a lot of support organizations like firefighters and, and uh, backup crew, etc. While um, the hydrogen system on Prisma uh, was few, uh, these two guys had, had another backup team ready to go in, in escape suits, and I think there were around 25 people around uh, for this shooting operation, including firefighters and and uh, uh, medic uh, support, etc. So it's a huge cost saving uh, compared to uh, doing hydrogen fueling. And we, we calculated it would be roughly one third of the effort loading with LMP 103S versus hydrazine. In orbit later on, we, we fired a lot of different uh, pulse mode operations, this being T on and duty factor. You can look into this charge later on uh, for, for details. But um, I would just like to point out that we did a lot of uh, in-flight firings comparable to what we did on ground in order to sort of compare uh, A to B, uh, the different two technologies, hydrogen versus uh, the LMP 103S. And these are uh, performance graphs um, assessed from the mission, also cor correlated with uh, ground-based uh, uh, tests uh, that we, from that, what we derived this model of uh, performance thrust versus uh, pressure and uh, ISP versus uh, thrust. And uh, you can see the performance gain compared to hydrazine. Uh, and um, that's, that's uh, quite significant for a small spacecraft where you need to be efficient with your volume, uh, normally your volume constraint on smaller spacecraft. Uh, this is a summary of the Prisma mission for the first uh, for the five years that was uh, it was operational maybe worth to point out uh, the um, amount of propellant consumed uh, during this uh, uh, mission was um, uh, roughly 5.5 5 kilograms uh, in total so split by two thrusters so the numbers you see here are, are divided by two thrusters uh, this would be the graph for the propellant uh, tank and important here is to see that you don't get any sort of pressure uh, rises and, and things like that during a mission is very stable, stable in this environment up there on orbit. And um, in total, we accumulated more than five hours of firings, more than 50,000 uh, pulses on two thrusters and uh, more than uh, 60 meters per second delta V. And uh, on ground, we've tested up to 25 hours uh, in total, uh, 1.5 hour on the longest firing and 24 kilograms of throughput. And the uh, conclusion being uh, from the Prisma mission that we, we provided 17% higher delta V per kilogram compared to the hydrazine uh, system on, on board. And there are some numbers here where you can assess uh, the difference at different um, types of firing, uh, steady state firing, single pulse firing, and pulse mode operations. And at best, uh, uh, yeah, you, you gain a significantly uh, higher uh, increase in, in performance compared to the, to the hydrogen system we had on board. So, moving on, uh, the high performance green propulsion uh, breakthrough on the market came really with the contract for the sky box imaging uh, constellation of Earth imaging satellites. And that was signed in, um, in 2011, late. Uh, that was the contract signed with ECAPS for propulsion modules. The first two satellites, uh, size 120 kilogram Earth observation satellites, sub-meter resolution, 
they were uh, launched without propulsion. And uh, when we delivered the, our prop module to, uh, to Terabella at the time, because they were acquired by Google, changed name to Terabella, later on uh, to, to, they were acquired by Planet. So it's been a bit of a history there. But uh, here you can see the full timeline of, um, uh, of the different sky sets uh, being launched into orbit. Uh, 2016, um, we had the first launch of, of the, um, uh, of the uh, propelled uh, sky set. And uh, actually, we had two launches during that year. And uh, more launches later on. And the, the final ones came, came um, uh, in August last year. Uh, completing the constellation of 21 spacecraft. Skyset propulsion module uh, utilized the sim similar thinking as for the, the Prisma satellite. It's a conventional blowdown system using, in this case, PMD tanks, uh, meaning that you have a, instead of having a membrane separating the pressurant and the propellant, you have a free, um, free uh, propellant surface, free waters or liquid surface to the uh, uh, pressurant. And um, in this case, we have uh, three tanks uh, connected in series. So you empty one tank at the time. Uh, the, the pressurant is pushing propellant from this tank into this one, and then finally empty the, the central tank uh, through the um, restricting orifice to minimize any risk for water hammering when priming the system. Uh, fill and drain valves, pressure transducers, uh, filter, uh, very traditional, and, and the isolation valve that's closed during launch, and you open up that uh, when you're in orbit. And then four one Newton thrusters uh, located like this, and this was the complete delivery from, from ECAPS to, uh, uh, to, to planet. And here you can see the propulsion module integrated to the satellite. Uh, it's really in its operational mode <laughs> when it's launching, so to say hanging upside down. So thrusters are point, pointing downwards instead of upwards, like, like uh, here on the pictures where, where it's more natural so to look at pictures from the, from the top, so to say. Uh, performance out of the SkySet constellation were also correlated with our uh, performance models uh, derived from wind tunnel, uh, not wind tunnel testing, but uh, fire, uh, hot fire testing at, at, uh, at ECAPS on ground and with the in-space data from Prisma, and then uh, a lot of data from different uh, sky sets uh, are, are sort of uh, plotted against uh, along this line to sort of just to verify that the performance models are, uh, are, are valid. <laughs> uh, the, the clouds of uh, test data you see here are from ground uh, testing during the acceptance testing. And uh, the reason why they are somewhat lower here uh, because uh, vacuum is not as good in the um, ground test facility compared to space and uh, a lot of these testings were done in different pulse mode operations during acceptance testing not reaching uh, uh, like uh, uh, steady state uh, or, or um, uh, yeah, uh, vacuum having effect uh, quite quite an impact on ground testing compared to space uh, so to say. Uh, looking at the different uh, well, scenario of blowdown in, in a system where you have a free water or a free liquid surface in PND tanks. Uh, here you can see from the sky set um, uh, C3, I believe it is, and uh, different maneuvers, how the pressure is dropping for each maneuver when you create delta V. And uh, this is a curve uh, for the remaining delta V uh, and the pressure and remain in propellant. So you would sort of follow this curve when the system is blowing down. And these lines here are indicating where you empty the first tank and the second tank and so on. So in total, uh, this is a summary picture showing the different launch camp campaigns that we've had and different test uh, activities around in the world. And um, Propellant has been shipped uh, all the time in this configuration on commercial aircraft. Uh, could be passenger plane, could be dedicated, you know, uh, freight uh, planes. Uh, it's been going from uh, Sweden uh, to uh, Japan to uh, Russia uh, to the launch site in, in Baikonur and uh, to Yasni. And um, 
into the U.S. several times. Hundreds of kilograms have been shipped into the uh, into NASA uh, Goddard uh, Wallops uh, test facility. It's been trucked to White Sands. It's been uh, shipped by plane to uh, Vandenberg, California, and to um, uh, the Cape. We also shipped to Peru and launched from there. And uh, all these campaigns have been uh, conducted in the same manner, uh, using uh, splash sort of protective uh, clean room suits only. And of course, you have uh, some some uh, masks available if you need, if you have to take care of some uh, uh, spill or, or some, um, let's say, uh, you break a high pressure line or something, then you then you have to sort of have something to, to be able to work in that environment for a long time, uh, like uh, a filtered or, or air filtered uh, mask. Uh, but that's kind of an industrial equipment that we use. Uh, and uh, here you can see some different pictures from different launch campaigns and, and how they are, are uh, dressed and working. Um, I have a few stories about that. Uh, one being that uh, during the launch campaign uh, at um, at Vandenberg, where we uh, were launching on the Minotaur C, uh, we had six uh, fueling of six uh, sky sets. Uh, during the fueling uh, session, uh, I think they it was uh, taking place in the same room as as one of the it was a Pegasus sitting there also uh, standing there uh, just waiting, and it was uh, a group coming through, uh, you know, tour tour group coming through while we were doing the fueling. So it was it was not regarded as a as a hazardous uh, operation. Pressurizing a system is always you know you have to be careful. You have to have these blast screens and things like that. But uh, just the handling of propellant has been very 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 um, easy in a way. And I think it was very much manifested in the two last launch campaigns where the three satellites each were launched on the top uh, of a Starlink stack um, with SpaceX Falcon 9. And during these campaigns, this was uh, 2020 in May, we started with the fueling. And uh, all of you know that it was during the pandemic, it was difficult for, for with transportation and, and, and shipping things and uh, all kinds of hassle. But it was also handled by, by our, our US partner Moog. And um, uh, all six spacecrafts were filled at the same time. Uh, they were stored at the facility outside of the launch base. Uh, for a month, roughly a well, month and a half for the, before the first launch of three satellites. And the remaining three satellites were launched in mid of end of August uh, of 2020. And they were sitting in storage fueled uh, all the way through May to uh, 18th of August when they were launched on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Falcon 9. So that is uh, also showing that the flexibility of having a green propellant uh, dealing with uh, logistics on launch sites. Another story is about the second launch from Vandenberg where we were on the SSOA um, uh, launch with uh, also with uh, SpaceX, but uh, with Spaceflight Industries. They had this huge stack of uh, satellites. I can't remember if it was 63 or 64 satellites in total. And uh, coming there with the hydrogen fueling would not have been possible due to the logistics of integration of all these spacecrafts. So that was another very important aspect of uh, having a green propellant coming into a, a, um, a, a consolidated launch of, uh, as a rideshare launch uh, is so much easier than to deal with, with hydrogen on, on such occasions. So on the horizon, uh, I can tell you we have a lot of, um, let's say, derivatives of the SkySat system uh, that is uh, being furnished and, and have been shipped to customers. Uh, we have uh, uh, the SL OMV, it's a Moog uh, space tug more or less that could uh, deploy smaller satellites uh, after separation, separation from the launch vehicle. That space tug is uh, propelled uh, with green propellant. And um, uh, I don't know if it's manifested or not yet, but it's uh, under contract at least. But the uh, next big show will be Astroscale's ELSA D uh, flying with a similar prop system like, like this, a Skyset system, but using eight thrusters instead of four. So we have thrusters in each corner of this uh, satellite. And this is uh, the first uh, 
orbit debris removal mission uh, in collaboration also with ESA. Uh, so this is a very interesting uh, mission to, to, to follow. And, and you can see the target satellite, that's the, the one that would be captured by this main satellite that's sitting on the top here. Uh, what else? Yeah, we, we see uh, partners and, and customers that are integrating this technology into their own, let's say, value added uh, activities like com compact systems, uh, highly integrated systems where you, where you more or less uh, machine and construct things in one piece part and, and you have uh, valves integrated into, into your structure. Uh, VACO has been working on something called micropropulsion systems using uh, 100 million newton uh, thrusters from, from ECAPS and the uh, lmp 13 s You can see the, the size of the thruster compared to a, a quarter here. Um, and they also have a larger system uh, similar in size of the Prisma prop system, but uh, using one newton thrusters and the highly integrated feed system. So the tank is part of of the, the structure and, and you have the feed system integrated into that. And nanoavionics nano also have uh, manufactured a small uh, propulsion uh, system for smaller satellites, cube sets down to maybe 6U or maybe 3U even, and, and with the modularity of larger tanks using the one Newton thruster. And, and this is also um, a very, very compact system and uh, very interesting to see how this is uh, evolving over time now. So there are a lot of different activities ongoing and we will definitely see this technology uh, being flown in the future and uh, for, for many many more missions and uh, it's something really one should consider uh, looking into the realm of uh, propulsion especially if you have to have a liquid if you find yourself in a situation where you need to have a liquid propellant a liquid propulsion where you get the high thrust um, early on in the mission I mean, there's a lot of competition, of course, from electric propulsion with high ISP but low thrust. Uh, so depending on the mission requirement, you, you may consider uh, liquid propellants and uh, green will certainly be one of the options to consider. So with that, I will say thank you. And I guess you may have some questions. That's great. Uh, Matthias, thank you so much. That was a, that was a great talk. I'm just going to take control mic, uh, if I can remember how. Um, so go to this and share top. Um, yeah, that's that's great. I, so I, I know we've got um, we've got some chemists and engineers in the audience. I, I'd I'd love to I'd love to. I'm looking forward to getting their their take on this because it seems to me. Um, no one should be using hydrazine anymore, we should all be using this. Um, so without further ado, what I'd like to do is move on to questions. So everyone, if you could try and track your attention or drop me a note in the, the comments and I will uh, unmute you or read out your, read out your question. Let's, let's see what we've got. Who's going to be first then? Okay, let, well, let me let me ask a question. Let me, let me do let me do something strange then and unusual. I'd like to ask John Harlow and Mark Perman. Mark, John, given what Matthias has just shown us there, is there any reason why people would really want to continue to use hydrazine? <laughs> you can answer that, Mark, or do you want me to? Mark, you're muted. Uh, should be online again now. I was um, actually, I have a whole series of questions <laughs> for Matthias. I'm sorry. Answer this one. And then we can answer your question. I think, Matthias, what's the? Uh, do you mind me asking what? What's the cost versus hydrazine? The yeah, cost cost for propellant is is uh, high, higher. I think what we. Um, I think we. Look, if you look at this at the per per kilogram cost or or similar, I think it's more than four times more expensive than hydrazine. And uh, it's uh, we did um, let's say 
trade studies where we where we assess the size of prop systems uh, and number of thrusters. They, they actually they are also more expensive than traditional hydrogen thrusters due to the material materials used in the thrust chamber. So they 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 uh, I mean it, it's really uh, a bit higher price than for for the uh, for the system and for the propellant as such. But looking at the if you take into consideration the launch uh, cost, the processing cost, then you could sort of find the the break even at a certain number of thrusters and a certain amount of propellant, uh, where where things were start to be more more expensive going with the green uh, alternative. Uh, although it it was always a, a, a let's say the plan uh, having volume manufacturing of propellant uh, would bring prices down a bit, but uh, and prices of hydrazine not being I mean, more or less defined by, by DLA and, and US Air Force, uh, <laughs> because they say the hydrazine should cost this, and then, then you know you have all the all that on tap on some basis and so on. So I think it's it will be more uh, expensive uh, for for the procurement. Uh, uh, it will potentially be if you look at the full picture, like for the Prisma and or the Sky sets, then you save money if you go for maybe a ton. Or propellant into a satellite and you have uh, 16 thrusters yes that it would be more expensive than hydrazine again uh, but i also think it's 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 due to the mission requirements if you have if you have a requirement of very very rapid response if you want to have fueled satellites sitting around and and uh, launching them when you need uh, that would be uh, maybe a scenario where you couldn't use hydrazine and and this would be a very good option then uh, or it would be very difficult to use hydrazine. Um, so uh, it's pros and cons, and and the major benefit, of course, with hydrazine being all the heritage. Uh, I mean, it's a huge amount of heritage with hydrazine, and, and you can't dispute that, of course. And and uh, but th there is a room for a lot of different technologies. Uh, so I, I don't think that we will offset hydrazine completely. I mean, it, it wouldn't would it be like that, but it will take a part of the market where this is pretty good and suitable. Okay, I, I ought to hold hold my hand up. I've worked on hydrazine monopropellant thrusters. So uh, yeah, so I have a background in hydrazine thrusters. Um, the question about your uh, catalytic heat, uh, the heating of the catalyst bed. What sort of temperature are you having to take that up to compared to a hydrazine thruster? Is, no, are you having to go higher or, or lower or? Uh, higher, yes, yeah. uh, higher because of um, uh, the propellant is so stable and, and, and uh, low volatility, so you have to heat it more. Uh, so we preheat to three three hundred uh, degrees, three fifty actually, right. and uh, that is, um, well, I guess, a hydrogen you could do two hundred degrees Celsius or something like that. A bit less, a bit less maybe. Yeah. So I mean, I would say. Uh, roughly, you could say it's uh, twice as power consuming compared to heating a hydrogen thruster. We oh. use a 10, 10 watt heat or maybe eight, seven watts on on, on, on average. Uh, hydrogen, I guess you have like four four watts or something like that uh, on the heater. Interesting. Or maybe less. Interesting, yeah. Um, John, have you got any questions? I, <coughs> pardon me. The, the only one I would ask, Matthias, is is there any equivalence you can see between the minimum impulse bits at very low uh, usage between hydrazine and uh, LMP-103. <clears throat> yeah, we, we uh, actually we've, we've done a lot of testing uh, and also on the, on the Prisma mission, we, we, we could see that we have a very, very uh, fast response on, on, on our thruster and, and uh, giving very good performance actually on, on the minimum impulse bits. Uh, but you have to have the preheated thruster, of course. That's that's number one. Uh, but I th think also that helps a bit. It's it's heated to a higher temperature, and you you get to uh, you get a very fast response. And um, uh, so performance actually are uh, I would say better than than hydrazine, at least for the pulses we've been firing on the Prisma. And and um, um, I could look into into the charts uh, I had there. Uh, some duties we were maybe on par on ISP compared to hydrazine, but some we were up to 12% better. Mm -hmm. uh, but the density also giving you uh, this addition of 24%. If you look at the density specific ISP, then of course you, you, you're 24 to, uh, 24 to 40 
percent better than hydrazine. Okay, on, 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 the, on the pure ISP, it could be on par or it could be up to 12% better. I think it's worth pointing out to those who might not know that um, before the engineers hand over to the scientists, uh, so to speak, with spacecraft, uh, they run all the thrusters anyway just to check them out and uh, they, get a, they clear their throat, so to speak. So they do get a warm-up to start with uh, before they go do their thing. I, I could add maybe another thing to the benefit of, of hydrazine, and that is we, we, we can't cold start our thrusters. I mean, they, they have to be preheated. And uh, most people know that, that hydrazine thrusters could be you know, like emergency started or cold started, but, but you would degrade them potentially. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's a possibility, and, and that, that might, be, might be another, of course, a major importance for, for some missions where you need, need that kind of reliability. Can I ask, do you get, to, do you suffer the same problem with your catalyst bed as you do with hydrazine, where you, if you fire it in an oxygen atmosphere, you can get, oh. You could, I didn't hear you. you Sorry, I, I had an accident this end. Um, do, do you, does your, <laughs> do your, uh, does your catalyst bed suffer the problems with oxygen poisoning if you fire it in an atmosphere? Uh, no, uh, I, I'm, we have um, no. I, I would say it's 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 not sensitive to, to atmosphere or or to to moisture. Uh, it is not. I mean, not the propellant either because it's containing water. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, we have experienced um, times when when uh, when if you do some kind of incomplete combustions that that you could clean out the thruster by, by having long firings, uh, sort of after a long time of hibernation or something like that. But uh, it's, it seems to be a less uh, severe problem than, than compared to hydrogen equivalent. I think all these technologies have their sort of uh, things to consider. It's always a lot of details to, to keep in mind, regardless which technology you use. But um, uh, but you have to be aware of that, and, and if you can work work around or work out the details, then 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 you're fine. But uh, if you if you're unaware, then you could end up in situations, so to say. <laughs> hmm. Well, um, have you got any plans to produce any larger thrusters? You, we're still talking about very small thrusters at the moment. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, true. And uh, maybe I. That's a good question, and uh, it's a technology that's actually scalable uh, up to higher thrust levels and I, I potentially I could try to share another picture actually if you if you don't mind so as you can see that we design that share uh, see if we are here uh, yeah so scalability is, uh, is something we've been working with on on, on this technology for, for a number of years and uh, one newton being the sort of workhorse for many missions, but uh, 25 newton. We've been doing a lot of work with uh, together with NASA, NASA Goddard uh, for a 22 newton thrust level, and uh, this thruster was fired with uh, 53 kilograms of throughput, and it was uh, considered for for a mission called Pace, um, uh, quite 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 a big uh, science mission, but. Um, uh, it, it, it did not make the, the timeline, the cut for the, for the decision to, to, they went with hydrogen at the end of the day, but uh, it was uh, very good performance, very, very good characteristics, but the development schedule did not fit. So yes, uh, it can be scaled up. And we also done, did a 200 Newton thruster for the, there was a demonstration together with um, um, Ariane, uh, uh, for, uh, for for the Ariane 5 uh, upper stage, uh, the um, RCS system on the upper stage to replace the hydrogen thrusters there. And we did that work together with uh, uh, Airbus in, in Bremen. And uh, also good performance. We could mimic all the hydrogen uh, operational modes for the for the, uh, what was needed. But uh, yeah, everyone knows it's a high, it's a Ariane 6 nowadays and, and I I think the rack system is, is hydrogen peroxide uh, out of NAMO, uh, or at least it was for a while. <laughs> uh, 
things are changing over time. But yes, it's scalable. And um, this is an important uh, look into that. And of course, I, I took this picture because it's in favor of the green, just to make you aware of that, because we, we look at the uh, uh, specific... Oh, we, can't, we can't see any pictures. Do you want, uh, do you want to share it? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, you didn't see it. Okay, no. okay got it. So let's see if I, what I did wrong here. Uh, <laughs> okay. But then it's easy to talk when you don't see anything. Uh, have, I, uh, have I stopped you from, from sharing? No, you should be able to share. While you're doing that, Matthias, I'll just add to, for uh, the people's benefit that if you look at where the sweet spot is in terms of the numbers of thrusters and the thrust required to satisfy the market, one newton's a pretty good sweet spot. I mean, Aerojet have produced now what, about 15,000 one newton hydrazine thrusters. So that gives you an idea of the numbers. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. And, and, and that's why we, we focused on the one newton for the early developments. And, 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 and later on, we have uh, manufactured more than 200 of, of the one newton thrusters. And, uh, and I, I know the order book was full when I left. So uh, it, it, it's the workhorse, uh, obviously. And uh, um, we will see, time will tell if, if, if these uh, larger thrusters and, and or the smaller thrusters which sort of uh, uh, enter into the market, uh, they, are, they are available, but um, um, not finalized in, in qualification. Uh, it's, still, it's still work, on, uh, work, work ongoing there, um, I would say. But yeah, one Newton's being the workhorse, definitely. Uh, this was the picture I was uh, looking at, and, and this is uh, you look at the vacuum specific uh, ISP, but it's also nor normalized with with um, uh, density. So uh, traditional monocoque thrusters uh, are, I mean, plotted here in in these curves um, in a blowdown type. Uh, so if you have a one newton one newton thruster, would would be would represent this curve, for instance. If you have a, 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 20, a five newton thruster, would, would kind of be that curve. Uh, sorry, five newton here, yeah. and and the, and the twenty newton thruster here, and so forth. And these are the curves for the green propellant NP one hundred three S, and the, I mean measured from from um, uh, hot firings we've done uh, on on these thrusters. Uh, we've done 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1, 5, 22, 50, and two hundred twenty newtons, and these would be kind of, you know, lower end of the biprop uh, regime. So it's kind of fitting nicely in between those two technologies, uh, monoprop hydrazine versus biprop, you know, MMH, um, NTO type thrusters. So, yeah, we have a verified scalability of this, but uh, one drawback being it's, it's requiring, you know, power to preheat. <laughs> We heat the cat bed, and it's uh, it's becoming a larger problem the larger the thruster uh, is. So, but um, this is actually the 22 newton working quite nicely, actually. Great. Uh, so thank we had, you. Um, we had a couple of uh, we had a couple of questions on on the chat. I think you've just answered two of them. So Jerome's asking about higher thrust, and Nick Proctor is asking uh, whether it could be applied to launch vehicles. Um, I've got uh, uh, Keith Burrell, who's asking um, if you increase the, the temperature of hydrazine, uh, does it have the same characteristics? Or is it not possible to do that, guys? <laughs> In combustion or uh, combustion temperature or...? Uh, do you get the same...? Yes. Um, if you heat it to the same temperature, do you get the same impulse? Uh, haven't if you superheat it with something extra yeah i i have not looked into that but our jets i guess john you you guys are have been working with that <laughs> well yes obviously with electrothermal you can pump as much energy in as you like um it's an open question yeah okay um uh, next up i've got uh, another question from nick proctor and uh, where do you see the competition with electric thrusters going uh, oh that's an interesting question. I think, I mean, electric has been around for, uh, also by Airjet, they have, have been sort of flying this for, for a long, long time on, on big missions with, with the telecom satellites and so on. And, and I, I, I believe that 
that of course is a is a very well defined area but you see a lot of these smaller spacecrafts nowadays with electric propulsion as well uh, just to compensate for drag and, and things like that I, I believe they could be uh, I mean, you have to look into your mission profile and your power budgets, etc. If you could uh, propel while you are doing your mission or not, uh, it could be that you create some interference and and you don't have the power to do your data capturing or or whatever you do in your mission while you're pro uh, propelling. If you have uh, too much of power that is needed, the other thing being that you you may have to do your maneuver for a very long time instead of doing things in, in, in a day or two or, or maybe a week, you, you may face months and months of, of maneuvers in order to get to your right orbit and, and, and things like that. And, and for a small satellite mission, if that could be, yeah, could, could be, uh, could be significant, uh, significantly reducing your operational time on orbit. So, I mean, it's a trade-off, but, but certainly it's, it's there for, to stay, I think. Electric propulsion will is a viable solution for many many different cases. It's not very good when you try to maneuver out of a debris uh, impact, perhaps because it's taking too long time to get out of the way, so to say. <laughs> or if you have to do something very urgent to maneuver out from a threat, uh, could be another active threat, for instance. Great. Have we any more questions? Yeah, hi Bob, I've got one. Sure. Uh, hi Matthias. Um, yeah, I do, uh, I work with a lot of students. We do educational student rocketry. Uh, we're always on the lookout for a much greener propellant uh, that could be used in PhD work or just doing basic educational work. I wondered if there was any scope perhaps for a, a lower quality catalyst. Um, could be used with perhaps a lower quality version of your fuel um, to do basic lab experiments, just to teach students the basics of uh, rocketry? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I, I mean, hydrogen peroxide has been used uh, quite, quite a bit in, 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 in as, as a fairly straightforward entry point in, in, into this uh, uh, area, but we, we've done, uh, the problem is that this propellant is burning so hot, uh, it's kind of melting down most catalysts, and, and uh, we've tested with, we, we were part of a Euro, uh, Horizon 2020 project with other European partners also, and, and, and uh, yeah, it seemed like the, that, like the one that we we have that's working, but it, we didn't find anything else out there that was like commercials of the shelf. And um, uh, I think you, you should post the question to, I could help you out with a point on contact at ECAPS nowadays, but um, uh, that was one of the sort of trade secrets or, or, or a bit of a, the most sensitive part of, of the technology to get the catalyst to work. And uh, that's why I think it's been kept very sort of close to heart. <laughs> that's absolutely understandable um it's just that uh peroxide um well it's becoming more and more difficult to use peroxide in the university environment uh, even just getting hold of it in the uk is becoming quite difficult um obviously you wouldn't want to divulge the secret of your catalyst uh perhaps there might be an alternative liquid catalyst that could be developed just mm. to get more performance but just to illustrate the basics I could, um, I, I will pass on the point of contact that you could discuss with, yeah. I think. Yeah. I, I would be happy to do that. Okay, next up, I've got a question from uh, Keith Burrell. Uh, Keith's asking, uh, what, what's the impact, uh, the chemical impact on uh, the ozone layer and on global warming? Mm. Uh, with this propellant, uh, I, I, I mean, it's, um, we, we are operating as, as, at such high altitude, I, I would say it's, it's, it should not have an impact on it. And the things coming out being water vapor, of course, that could mostly, I mean, uh, or, or similar to what you get from combustion of, of other things here on, on, on ground. Uh, 
So it's it's benign in in itself like that, but I I don't think it's having a major impact. And normally when you propel a thrust, you you uh, it's not that's not coming down into the atmosphere again normally, unless you're braking. I mean, if you brake your spacecraft, maybe re-entering the spacecraft. John, do you have any other thoughts there? No, I, I think it's a good one about um, mishaps. Perhaps there's a great advantage to have green propellants if there's any kind of mishap at any stage, yeah. whether it's on the moon or in orbit or, or on Earth. That's true, and, and that's uh, maybe if I elaborate on that a little bit, we were talking about pros for, for hydrazine, and, and, and of course there are, are many, but one major for the green being that it, if you don't have the infrastructure for dealing and handling hydrazine, uh, you would hardly get that uh, to your launch site, or, or there are new launch sites uh, popping up uh, around the world. I mean, New Zealand, uh, you have uh, how many, a handful uh, out there in UK, uh, Wales, Scotland, uh, Shetlands, and, 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 and so on. And uh, they are using, want to use uh, regular air bases and, and, and do this, um, uh, yeah, to, to fly with an airplane to lift up, the, the, like the Pegasus and, and, and similar. So, I mean, uh, you really don't want to have hydrazine around. Uh, and if you have an accident, definitely that's going to, be a big problem for you. So, uh, in I think Rocket Lab is a good example. In, in their in their manifest for for payloads or, or satellites, they they've been stipulating from from day one they they could, couldn't fly hydrazine from from New Zealand. They don't have permits for it, and and the green would be the only option. And and I think that would be uh, uh, something that's changing a bit in favor to the green over time as well. Uh, but if you have uh, been dealing with, I, I, I've been discussing quite a bit with, with uh, people at, at KSE and, 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 and uh, Wallops Flight Facility and, and Vandenberg. And they, I mean, they have everything there already, and, but still it's a huge cost for them. But uh, uh, just the, the offset of not having to use the escape suits, that's a huge saving. Uh, I mean, still they have hydrogen on base but just that they don't need to refurbish and, and to deal with the escape suits, that, that's saving a lot of money. And maybe you could do processing in facilities not rated for hydrazine, that's going to save you a lot of money too, uh, if they allow that. I mean, they could charge you anyway, but uh, <laughs> time will tell. I could add there, Matthias, some many years back now, uh, Aerojet looked at joining forces with Kinetic to put some test sites, some liquid engine test sites back in to Farnborough. Mm. Uh, and even the problems with monopropellants were, were too much. They walked away from it. Mm. Having, having worked with hydrazine, um, I, can, I, I can say it's very unpleasant having to wear all the gear and, uh, and the cleanliness standards that you have to maintain um, and the uh, and the staff discipline that you need to uh, maintain to 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 have a safe working environment uh, it takes it it's expensive it takes a lot of doing so um, yeah there's an awful lot of a lot awful lot of gains to be to be made with this green propellant mm. excellent okay. I, I have a uh, actually I need to, to elaborate on that too uh, the last campaign here I talked about the one fueling in at, at KSC, uh, or sorry, at, at the Cape um, uh, in May here, uh, they, when they started that campaign, uh, took one day to <coughs> unpack and to, you know, get, get prepared. They filled uh, two spacecrafts a day. Uh, so day one, day, do, day two, day three, they filled all the six spacecrafts. And day um, uh, five, they, they, uh, they were... Um, uh, everything was uh, packed up in, 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 you know, all equipment, everything was done for, for shipping back home, so the, the people left. So, I mean, in, in, in five days, they, they processed uh, six spacecrafts uh, to a day. And, um, yeah, that, that's pretty impressive. And then put the spacecraft into storage uh, for a month, month and a half before they were taking them out, uh, shipping them to the base for integration to the launch vehicle. 
and three of them were sitting still in the in this uh, storage uh, for another two two months. I I think that that is really showing the potential of, of green uh, in in the world of being responsive, being uh, ease of handle, and so on. Uh, great. Uh, I've got some more questions. Uh, Alec Woods asks, uh, are there any uh, uh, other companies developing alternatives to hyperzine? Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, Airjet uh, Rocketdyne, of course, being the, the, I would say, number number one in the business uh, uh, of, of propulsion. And, uh, and Moog, uh, I think, uh, should be number two in, in the sort of uh, size of, of activities. So, yes. These companies are also working with green alternatives and uh, uh, mainly focusing on 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 the on the U.S. Uh, technology uh, hand hand based. It's similar, but uh, not not the same. But it's an ionic liquid uh, burning even hotter, I believe. Uh, so it's it's more challenges, but uh, also more gains if you if you if you are successful. And they've flown the first mission to uh, uh, the GPIN mission last year. Great. And uh, uh, and Amelia asks um, uh, about the uh, how the thrust chamber was manufactured and uh, and what material was used again. Okay. Yes. The the, the thrust chamber uh, is um, made of iridium, and iridium lined rhenium. So it's a it's a very complicated method of manufacturing these uh, these uh, thrust chambers. You either you could use uh, uh, atomic vapor deposition uh, to de deposit this on the mandrel or uh, in our case we, we use a manufacturer uh, in, in the US who is um, uh, using um, melted uh, salt solution and, and they have uh, uh, it's called electroforming uh, you have a uh, mandrels uh, dipped into this uh, molten salt solution and then you do electro yeah you, you deposit the metal by, by running uh, current through <laughs> And, and then you get get back the, the metal on on the surface. So it's you grow the, the chamber more or less, and then you have to use uh, uh, EDM and, and, and grinding to get to the final outer shape of the of the chamber. So it's very time consuming and, and expensive, unfortunately. But um, potentially one could use platinum alloys, the, the higher higher grades of platinum alloys, but. Uh, uh, then, then we would need to tune down the propellant slightly to, to burn a little less hot, so to say. Uh, we have a version of propellant called, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, it, it's burning 100 and what is it, 300, uh, 1370 degrees Celsius instead of 1600, and, and that potentially could be used uh, together with platinum alloys. Still expensive, but uh, there you can machine with traditional methods, and, and that's more affordable. And that is something that's a good lesson actually to to have when when looking into performance is always let's say it's easy to look at the the the, the highest combustion temperature or or the most fancy propellant but you have to get it to work in a thruster and that is the trick that is really difficult if you the, the closer to the margin you are <laughs> of, of what materials you could use then then uh, yeah the more difficult it is Great. I've got another question from Alex Wood. He is, is, uh, picks you up on when you were mentioning uh, that uh, fueling two, two craft a day was impressive. He asks, why does it take so long uh, to, to fuel a craft? Mm. Uh, mainly because, you, you first of all, you, you have to handle everything in a very strict way regarding contamination and make sure that you don't get anything that should not get into your prop system. So, I mean, you have to be working with with, with uh, cleaned and, and, and uh, closed and kept uh, equipment and then you have to do leak checks to make sure that things are tight before you transfer propellant and pressure in. and uh, so it's a lot of that type of handling the transfer of propellant itself uh, to the sky sets uh, 10.5 kilograms that's an operation about one hour you have a small uh, orifice that is restricting the flow rate that's how the system was designed uh, but uh, moreover you have to when you put in the pressurant uh, 
that you that you do at the end of, of, of your fueling, uh, you have to make sure that you uh, let the system wait and, and, and rest a bit to, to equalize and, and sort of don't you, you don't want to get fluctuations in pressure later on if you you know um, if you push in something into 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 a closed volume it's get heated up <laughs> so you have to be careful when you transfer uh, volumes of gas and, and make that in a slow way that's that's taken most of the time i would say together with the leak checks and, and things like that wouldn't it be nice if we could just gas up and go <laughs> That would be nice, yes. <laughs> it's even worse with uh, fueling for for uh, xenon for for electrical thrusters. That's that's very yeah, an, an, an interesting physics there. How to transfer a large amount of xenon into into a big uh, uh, propellant tank? <laughs> and you get a chattery valve as well, and it will scream at you. I don't know whether any of you guys have ever dealt with the inert gases, but they have strange properties. Mm. Are we any more questions? Okay, I, I think that's it. So I, I think uh, in which case uh, I will say, Matthias, thank you so much. It's been great to have you here today. Uh, we've actually earned a lot. Um, and uh, I, 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 I don't know what else to say. It's, it's, it's been great. It's been great, everyone. So thank you very much. And thank you all for, for attending today. It's been great to see so many people. And uh, this, that's from Matthias, by the way. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for for taking the time over the weekend to, 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 to listen in. I, I was surprised to see so many of you, but, but you have a good large community active, it seems. So that's, that's great. And uh, this is a good way to, to stay in touch and and work together, I think, uh, in these uh, difficult times. So uh, all of you stay healthy and uh, hope that things will move on to the more normal in a few months or so. So, yeah, have a good one. I can be a stranger. Keep in touch.